All kinds of little gremlins after the first rain. Clear! construction at Oroville Dam and Spillway. It's Tuesday, the 14th of November, and tomorrow we'll get a press briefing on the current status at Oroville, the first part of phase two. Remember, phase one didn't stop construction. The construction just continuing through. Phase one was just a milestone where they got the spillway back together. Phase two is gonna proceed for another year and a half. Don't mind your uh, speakers on your computer. This interphone in the Mighty Luscombe here, intercom, is only working on one channel. So we've had our first series of rains for the season. This year we're still behind average on rainfall and far less rain has fallen than this same time uh, last year. We just had a good rainfall last night over half an inch back at Blanco Lirio headquarters and uh, we're expecting another heavy storm tomorrow night. So today's a good day to get out here and get an aerial update. But now that we're back into this season, we're starting to see Thule fog free form back in the valley. That's where the Sacramento Valley gets uh, fog in the mornings, indicating lots of moisture in the air. What does that mean to you as a pilot? Carburetor ice. The uh, small here. engines in these aircraft, typically, and especially the O200 engine, uh, has a simple marble driveler, driveler, marble shuttler carburetor, updraft carburetor, to feed the engine. That updraft carburetor has a venturi that creates low pressure to suck the fuel out of the flow bowl and into the engine. As you remember from high school physics, you drop the pressure, what happens to the temperature? It drops as well. So on a day like today, even though it's clear in a million, lots of moisture in the air, your carburetor is gonna be prone to carburetor icing. So what do we do? We got carburetor heat. It vents off a little bit of warm air, warm fresh air off of the exhaust, off of the heat of the exhaust mounts and pipes it over to the uh, carburetor. But what do you do when you put warm air into a fuel mixture? You enrich in the mixture. So how do you know your carb heat's working? You, you look for an RPM drop. <laughs> First you look for a good place to land, <laughs> just in case it craps out all together. You can hear, feel, and see the difference in RPM, about 100 RPM drop, as that warm, richer air goes through the carburetor, enriches the mixture, and drops the RPM. And that's a good thing. If the RPM did not drop, that would indicate to you that your carburetor heat system is not working, or your carburetor is so choked up, it's gotta thaw out that ice, and that engine is really gonna stumble as it thaws that ice out. I try a little lower RPM setting here. See if we can see it even more dramatically. Another thing about carburetor ice to remember is that if you want to decrease the pressure differential inside your carburetor, increase your power. As you increase power, that pressure differential decreases and so does the difference in temperature. So let's bring it back to here. Now let's apply some carb heat, boom, there you go, uh, 75 RPM drop. And you can feel it in the trim of the airplane too, instantly. Less power, you gotta trim the nose up. 
All right, let's descend on down for Orville Dam and get off of this crummy headset interphone system here and get an update. That concludes today's flying lesson at the Mighty Lusco. Well, Wednesday came and went with no press briefing update from the Department of Water Resources, so we're going to have to wing it a little bit here today. So we're looking at about the lowest level we'll see at Oroville Reservoir this year, about 689 feet. Inflows have been matching outflows, only about 3,500 CFS or so. But with this big rainstorm here today, Thursday, the 16th of November, inflows have jumped up to 27,000 CFS in, and the water level has risen uh, over two feet rather quickly. Still, well over 100 feet to go before they reach the 800 foot new flood operating minimum that they're going to operate the reservoir at for this flood season. So plenty of room in the reservoir for plenty of rain. As we approach the inlet to the spillway we can get one last good look at the mysterious inlet structure to the power plant that never was. And remember too, the inlet to the main spillway here is at 813 foot elevation, so chances are they still won't even run this spillway despite these heavy rains, unless they really pile up this year like they did last year. But despite the rains, work continues on phase two, primarily on the emergency spillway and the secant cutoff wall and some finishing touches on the main spillway. And some of that work includes some blasting on the emergency spillway shown in this general area in red. And here's a closer look at what's going on from the ground. You can see a drill rig there in the middle of the picture. And they want to blast this, this one outcropping of rocks on the very north end of the emergency spillway. Blast it down so they could make a, a relatively smooth transition of roller compacted concrete from the beginning of the emergency spillway all the way down to the secant cutoff wall. The edge of the old boat ramp shown in red here is the beginning of the emergency spillway and this wall is getting beefed up. And one of the big cost overruns of this project is right here. Uh, originally the secant cutoff wall shown by the blue line here was to be a mere 300 feet below the beginning of the emergency spillway. But geological testing of the bedrock down there indicated incompetent bedrock and so they decided to move the secant cutoff wall 700 feet below the beginning of the emergency spillway to get to competent bedrock and now the contractor has to provide twice as much roller compacted concrete as was the original design for the emergency spillway. Speaking of costs, which we talked about in the last update, somewhere north of $600 million, the question keeps coming up, how is this going to be paid for? Well, the idea is that FEMA is going to come in at 75% and California water users to pay the remaining 25%. Which may be a challenge as FEMA is already stretched very thin from all the other natural disasters that have hit the United States this last year. And this will be done with a series of smaller remittances from FEMA and this process will take quite a bit of time. As we come around the spillway you can see more of the hydro seeding operations, the green areas, kind of a mixture of grass seed, fertilizer mulch, and some form of tackifier to glue it all together. And this is going to be a challenge during these heavy rains this year to keep all these access roads operational. Some of the final punch list items they're working on inside the main spillway include the final finish coat on some of the structural walls, dry packing some remaining bolt holes, and cleaning out and caulking in between the structural concrete panels. And this is kind of neat. They're using these ROVs, remote operated vehicles, to inspect the drain system underneath the spillway. As we swing out wider, we can get a little better view of how the electrical transmission lines have been completely rerouted around the main spillway and emergency spillway. Now this is a non-Kiwit contractor and the cost of this work has yet to be added to the bill. 
But these guys did an incredible job of moving these power lines around without injury. Mostly all done with the Hughes 500C helicopter and a long line. The original transmission lines from the Hyatt power plant went right over the main spillway and the face of the emergency spillway. During the emergency, erosion from the emergency spillway threatened the footings of these power lines, so the lines were cut and dropped to the ground. Remember, without a Hyatt power plant connected to the grid, it can no longer operate. It can no longer flow water out of the Hyatt power plant. So the better long-term solution is to reroute the transmission lines completely around the main spillway and emergency spillway. But first crews had to build a shoe fly or temporary connection along the existing transmission line, the blue line, to get the Hyatt power plant reconnected to the grid. Then the crews are able to disassemble the existing towers and move the towers to the new locations, then string the new wire and then remove the shoe fly connection, keeping the Hyatt power plant operating. Remember, if the Hyatt power plant is not connected to the grid, you cannot run the turbines because you'll spin them up too fast. Turbines. And here's what some of the newly routed transmission lines look like today. So we'll keep track of this phase two of the Orville Spillway Construction Project uh, reporting in probably every two weeks or so. Thanks again for staying tuned and all your great support of this channel. The last video uh, showing phase one done received almost 1,000 very nice well thought out comments. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you here. Another no excuse landing. One little side slip. Right there. Dial it in. Hold it off. Shift your aim way down the runway. Let's go get some gas. Try and keep it straight, Brownie. 